Hello, everyone. Welcome to this next episode of Mocktails and Masterpieces. We have a very exciting program coming up this Saturday night with the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra celebrating a composer who is uh, so loved uh, and widely performed, uh, Astor Piazzolla, the Argentinian tango master, who's celebrating a 100th centenary or the, his centenary uh, this season. And uh, we're delighted to welcome an incredible guest artist uh, who I'll introduce in just a moment here, just to say that we are coming back to Clues Hall with a live audience, which we couldn't be happier about. Um, as many of you know from watching this broadcast, uh, it, as so many arts organizations have been, greatly affected uh, by uh, the pandemic and the inability to put on live concerts. We've been virtual uh, for most of the past 12 months. Just a few weeks ago, we were up at the Palladium in Carmel for a live audience, and now we're returning uh, to our home base at Butler University in Clues Hall uh, with live ticketed audience, which we are thrilled about. Uh, also interesting to note that this is the only program from the original 2021 20, season uh, that's still intact. Everything that we've done for the last 15 months has been a revised program in some way or, the, uh, or another, but this uh, Piazzolla centenary celebration uh, was originally on uh, the, the 2021 program uh, over two years ago when the season was programmed. Who could have foreseen uh, what we've gone through here? So uh, I am delighted for that uh, and to celebrate this great composer. And our guest artist is an incredible musician that I had the opportunity to work with uh, about three or four years ago with the West Michigan Symphony in a program called Tango Caliente. And you cannot possibly have an Astor Piazzolla celebration without uh, performing the music on his native instrument, the instrument that Piazzolla himself played, the bandoneon. So it is a great pleasure to welcome Grammy award-winning artist Hector Del Curto. Hector, welcome to this program. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a great honor to, to be doing this live performance with audience after such a long year and collaborating with you one more time. When we worked together uh, up in Muskegon those years ago, I said, Hector, I, we're not even halfway through this program and I've got to figure out how to get you down to Indianapolis because your artistry, you know, the diversity of, of, of um, not just, you know, the, the music and the, the, uh, the, the way that you uh, work on stage was, was, so, was so unique, so free, but yet so structured. Uh, you know, it was just, it was like, you know, working with somebody who was just completely comfortable in so many genres of music. And of course, that program uh, was tango, but, uh, you know, your improvisation, uh, your understanding of counterpoint and harmony, uh, it was really, it was really such a fascinating experience for me because it was the first time that I had worked with a bandoneon player. Uh, and for anybody who's tuning in right now and is perhaps unfamiliar with this instrument, perhaps you could tell us about this instrument that is so ingrained in the music of your country, Argentina and perhaps its most famous tango composer of the 20th century, Astor Piazzolla. Yes, well, the bandoneon is a, a very inter interesting instrument because um, it was not meant to be a, an instrument for tango and it was created in Germany and uh, the end of uh, 1900s, uh, 1800s, I'm sorry. And um, then it was created to replace the organ in processions for religious uh, music and also for classical music. Um, the first the instruments were smaller than this one and for classical music they started to add buttons to this instrument and it became um, a complete mess. <laughs> it has no logic on the keyboard and uh, therefore it was not very successful in, in Europe. So they decided to export it to Argentina and we adopted the instrument and it became, uh, it's such a unique sound that it became the voice of tango. So everywhere you hear bandoneon these days, you will think about Buenos Aires, you will think about tango. Mm -hmm. I love that story because again, it's just, it's an anecdote that you would never have any, any idea about, but you know, this instrument that was, uh, you know, just basically discarded in Europe now becomes the foundation of this, this incredible and rich uh, uh, dance and, 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 and folk culture that you have there in, in Argentina. It's a notoriously difficult instrument to play, which again, I would never have known had you not demonstrated how this instrument works. I mean, uh, we've got a great clip that we'll, we'll show of you uh, playing um, in a few moments here, but just to describe, it's not like a violin, you know, where you put your finger on the fingerboard and it stops the string or piano, which instantaneously you touch a key and a note speaks. It's almost like it's backwards in some ways. 
Well, it's, it has no logic in, in the order of the buttons. So you can have, the, the advantage of that is that you can play any octave at any moment and you can play up to eight notes uh -huh. and uh, simultaneously. So you can play any octave in those eight notes, not like the piano that you have to extend your, your hands and it will not reach. But at the same time, it's uh, any note can be anything. So unless you learn the map, um, you cannot see the keyboard. So there was no GPS at that time, so no guidance <laughs> for that. So um, yeah, it's a it's a difficult instrument, like any other instrument. Also, um, to to play it well, you have to practice any instrument. But um, to decode this instrument is the most difficult part at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk a little bit about this, uh, the composer who we're celebrating, Astor Piazzolla. Uh, you know, he's, he's, his music is ubiquitous uh, in, in American culture, uh, through the Americas, I should say, uh, it, both in its kind of classical form, you know, you'll find him in concert halls played by orchestras, numerous arrangements for different ensembles. He wrote classical uh, orchestral works as well, Tangazzo, a Sinfonietta, for example, a Bandonion Concerto. Uh, but he's he's just uh, ingrained in popular culture as well. You hear his music in movies. Um, you hear it performed uh, in, in 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 various places, not just concert halls. Um, what is Piazzolla's place in Argentinian music? What did he do specifically for the tango, uh, which was not he didn't invent obviously. It had been around long before him. But he's got a very important place in the history of Argentina's music and also in tango music as well. So yes, uh, Astor Piazzolla is called the father of new tango. And um, for traditionalists, that was not very welcome. And um, he was rejected for a long, long time until the end of his life, um, almost. He, he didn't succeed in Argentina. But yet he um, was born in Mar del Plata. It's uh, near the coast of, uh, of Argentina. and. Um, he actually moved to New York when he was five years old with his family. And then he started to learn other cultures. So at some point when he was an adolescent, he went to Argentina, back to Argentina and started to study with different people until he won a competition and studied with Nadia Boulanger in um, France. So he became um, he started to know more about classical music and uh, he started to incorporate elements of classical music into tango and uh, again he goes back to Argentina and is completely rejected and um, he left Argentina once again and he went to Italy and he did different um, um, experiments with music and, and uh, different formations, electronic groups all kinds of uh, new ideas. Finally, he was so um, welcome all over the world that in Argentina, people say, oh, this guy is Argentinian. So <laughs> we are very proud of him. <laughs> so, um, but yes, he suffered, he suffered a lot throughout his life. And probably that's one of the uh, um, key ingredients to the success of his music you know, struggle and, and trying to overcome that struggle and trying to uh, prove to people that his music was uh, worth it. And, uh, and he did big time because these days um, we are playing tango uh, with Indianapolis, um, but uh, it's because of him, because he brought the music to the classical stages and jazz stages and everybody in the world now is playing Piazzolla. It's interesting because you know, as you're describing his story, it's not uncommon uh, amongst great composers. I was immediately thinking of Hector Berlioz who found fame in, in the rest of Europe and even in the, in the United States, but in, in France, his native country, he was you know, pretty much uh, an afterthought or it was certainly not considered one of the great composers for much of his life. And the, the incorporation of the classical elements here too, um, the chamber orchestra just played uh, at Holiday Park this past September, uh, a Fuga Mysterio where he incorporates the same fugue style you know, that Bach used and, uh, and, and developed it around a tango. And it's just amazing to hear these, these centuries old classical elements of form 
uh, and design now being woven into the Nuevo Tango here. Before we talk about the pieces that you're going to play uh, with the Chamber Works this weekend, uh, now is a great time to, to uh, allow our listeners a chance uh, to, to hear you play. We're going to uh, switch over to video here, uh, but it's worth noting that you come from a very musical family. Grandfather, I believe, if I know the story correctly, was a bandoneonist as, as well. Uh, and you are also now in a musical family of your own. So I'm going to allow you the, the opportunity here to set up this video and talk a little bit about this musical, great musical family you come from. Well, thank you. And uh, yes, my great grandfather was uh, actually a bandoneon player as well. So it comes from four generations of musicians. Now it's the fifth one with my son, but he doesn't play bandoneon. He plays clarinet. And my wife is a, is a wonderful cellist that um, she, it's, it's uh, from South Korea and she studied at Juilliard. So that's my experience with classical music. I got it from my wife and now my son is playing classical, jazz, tango, klezmer. So he it's uh, exploring all these uh, different worlds of music, which I think it's the key to develop his own voice in the future. He's now 13 years old. At the time of this video, he was uh, 2000, I think he was 11. And um, so this is a piece that I composed um, because my son had the dream. When he was uh, about three years old, he watched the movie, uh, Mr. Bean Holiday. And in this movie, Mr. Bean goes from Paris to Cannes in uh, France for the film festival, he wins a prize. And of course, all kinds of things happen throughout it, but um, he travels on the TGV. And since then, my son wanted to do this trip. It was his dream. So he started to save money early on. And finally I got, um, I was performing with Paolo Ziegler, um, who was a pianist of Astor Piazzolla in, um, in the proms in uh, London. And uh, so we decided to stay for a few days and go to France and just uh, recreate that, that trip that Mr. Bean did with my son and my wife. It was a wonderful time. And then I came back and I came up with this melody and it became a piece. And then we, um, I specially composed this piece dedicated to my son and my wife. So it features the cello, the clarinet, of course, and the bandoneon. And I recorded with uh, um, my orchestra that I have a festival in Stovermont called the Stowe Tango Music Festival. And this is the orchestra from the festival. So this piece is called Paris to Cannes. Excellent. Here's Hector and his very talented musical family.
Hector, that was terrific. Thank you for contributing that video for us. Um, all, a lot of us have had uh, our schedules upended, uh, you know, obviously for the last 15 months, and certainly that's been uh, the case for you as well as we were talking prior to this uh, recording. Uh, but you found a very interesting project uh, to kind of keep yourself busy the last couple of months, and it's extremely impressive. I did, you built that studio behind you. Uh, you're a carpenter, an electrician, uh, on top of being, you know, a, an incredible composer and bandoneonist. Tell us a little bit about how you learned carpentry. I'm just curious. It's beautiful. Well, actually, I'm, I'm one of those cases where you never thought that you were going to be a musician. And uh, when I was uh, 12 or 13 years old, I went to high school. And in high school, I studied, um, in, like, um, a technical um, uh, professions like I, I'm a te mechanical technician or something like that how you call it and um, so I learned a lot of different trades in in school and uh, then uh, I came to this is my well this is not part of the house this is outside the house in the forest so behind that window there is a whole forest and uh, so I needed space to accommodate to, to the times of the pandemic. And I was streaming uh, classes and, and I have some clubs that I do for Bandoneon players and, and talks. And uh, I was doing that from my basement. I said, I need a place. So with my friend, my neighbor, we started to build this place from the ground up. So um, it's two floors now and wow. um, and it became, I mean, this is a, a unique place for me. I never had um, something where I can concentrate so much. There is nothing around other than some animals, including bears outside. <laughs> but um, for composing music, for um, teaching, for uh, streaming, we do recordings here. We did a couple of recordings with my family. So the three of us are in the house. And so we don't have to play solos all the time. So <laughs> it's great. I, I mean, I, I enjoyed building it very much. I couldn't do it if I was performing because you don't, you know, it's not very compatible to have a table saw and uh, a bandoneon in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. I mean, Mahler had a composing hut. It just seems absolutely essential, you know, to have that space where you can you can concentrate, you can compose, you can you can perform. So congratulations on that. Let's talk a little bit about what you're going to play this weekend. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is the only program you know that we put together two years ago that's still on this season. Everything else has changed, uh, but it was important that we did get this in because of the 100th birthday celebration for Piazzolla. So obviously you're playing Piazzolla with us. I'll just mention that the orchestra is also playing uh, an incredible 20th century work by a compatriot of Piazzolla, Alberto Ginestera, his variations, uh, Variations Concertant, which is a, uh, a tour de force for all of the individual instruments of our spectacular orchestra. And just uh, 23 minutes, it's a real, uh, real fireworks and uh, pyrotechnics galore. It's, it's an incredible piece, but also a work by a living composer named Gabriela Lino Franck, uh, that was written in 2012, her uh, concertino Cusqueño, which is another uh, solo concertante uh, work that features uh, four string players, just like you would find in, in a Corelli Concerto Grosso. Uh, but she uh, explores heavily her Peruvian roots, uh, as well as her influences, uh, one of which is Hina Stera, but Benjamin Britten she lists as well. Um, so there are two works that feature just the orchestra, but really at the center of this program, of course, is Hector's uh, performance. And you're playing a piece which, uh, by its name, everyone will know, but uh, maybe not familiar that, uh, or not uh, well known, is that uh, Piazzolla wrote one of these as well. Of course, everyone knows of all these four seasons. You're playing Piazzolla's four seasons. Could you tell us a little bit about this extraordinary work? 
Yes, this is one of the examples of uh, Piazzolla and his relationship with uh, classical music. And he composed uh, the Four Seasons, which includes also um, a fugue. And uh, like Vivaldi, he's uh, representing the Four Seasons, but from Buenos Aires. And um, so it's, it's an amazing, um, um, I don't know if you call it sweet, but um, of four pieces. And, uh, and I, I always enjoy it very much. These pieces can be played um, as the four seasons, so it can be each one an individual piece that, that it's uh, within the, the piece you have absolutely every single um, every every single element of uh, of uh, Piazzolla's composition and um, it's I mean it's it's a wonderful piece Primavera Porteña with the fugue at the beginning uh, very exciting um, very um, very inspiring uh, Invierno Porteño that has uh, this subdued climax in, in the piece. And um, you have Verano Porteño, also another energetic piece. And uh, Otoño, it has a little bit of all of them. So I think um, it's a, a lot of variety within the, the four seasons. I think we did spring together in our concert. I think that was part of the program, if I recall correctly. But it's interesting to note that, you know, this uh, version that we're playing isn't by Piazzolla. Of course, the music is all Piazzolla, but um, perhaps audiences have heard an arrangement for violin soloist in orchestra by a Russian arranger, which is quite popular. Uh, but the arranger for this set that we're doing has very uh, authentic ties to Piazzolla. And you've already referenced him. Pablo Ziegler is a musician that you've worked with and he's done the arrangements for the show. Can you talk to us about uh, Pablo? You already mentioned that he was in Piazzolla's uh, musical group performing, but what is it about Pablo's perspective on Piazzolla? And you perform with Piazzolla as well, um, about you know, the, 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 the take that you know, makes this kind of a, a unique uh, uh, tie, a new voice of Piazzolla is an extension, really. If Piazzolla were really to have to, done the orchestration, uh, Pablo has got those authentic ties. Yes, uh, Pablo was uh, the, the pianist of uh, Piazzolla's quintet. This was the most well-known quintet from Piazzolla that was from 1978 to 1988. And, um, and Pablo was uh, there learned from since a very young age. He learned all the um, um, techniques that Astro Piazzolla will, will use and as well all the tango because Pablo Silva was not the tango pianist. He was a jazz pianist and uh, classical. And Piazzolla called him one day and he said, you know, I want you to come and play with my group. And uh, Pablo said, but I'm not the tango pianist. And Piazzolla said to him, that's why. <laughs> so he brought his own language into the quintet of uh, Astro Piazzolla. Now, when we talk about the authenticity of the music, first of all, he respects um, every single thing that Piazzolla wrote in, in the arrangements because Piazzolla didn't write the piece and then orchestrated. He wrote for the quintet and uh, with the particular sound in his mind. So that most of the times uh, it's a good idea to respect it. And uh, there are not things that are um, stereotypes um, because sometimes when people try to arrange tango from Buenos Aires, or you say the four seasons, then they will add pieces of Vivaldi in the piece. And mm -hmm. so this is all meant to be like uh, Asso Piazzolla brought the piece and uh, Pablo Ziegler orchestrated. And you'll also perform at the end of the program, Oblivion, which is so beloved, uh, and the Lieber Tango to close the program as well with uh, Pablo's arrangements here. Hector, we're just thrilled that you're able to join us uh, in Indianapolis as now we, we push forward to reopening and, and live performances here. Uh, there are still tickets available for any of you watching this right now. We have about 80 seats left available in clues before we reach our cap. Uh, and there's also the live stream option as so many of you have chosen to do, you can continue to be part of the ICO family and, and our performances by tuning in uh, with that. But uh, Hector, we're, we're looking forward to, to welcome, welcoming the Indianapolis a Grammy award-winning Bandonian. It's a very fine musician and uh, classical composer and a carpenter, <laughs> a very impressive 
uh, all of it that, that you do so effortlessly. So we'll look forward to celebrating uh, Piazzola. And uh, in the meantime, anyone you can find Piazzola well represented on YouTube, as well as uh, Hector, I encourage you to do so uh, as we celebrate the centenary of Astro Piazzola. Hector, we'll see you soon. Uh, thanks for, so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Matthew. And I'm so looking forward to it and celebrating not only the 100 years of Astro Piazzola, but also the return of uh, the audience to to the concert hall. Agreed. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.